What do the Wright brothers, Alexander Graham Bell, and the guy who invented this fold-up bridge thing have in common? They were all weird. See, being weird doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Weird can mean innovating, challenging the status quo, or sometimes doing something totally insane just because you can. Throughout the history of motorsports, there's been an overwhelming amount of weird. So let's celebrate it and take a look at my picks for the weirdest race car from every decade. World War II might have been over, but in the mid-1950s, an Italian company was hard at work constructing a brand new submarine. But I'm not talking about a defense company. I'm talking about Nardi. Yes, the same Nardi that makes the steering wheels that car bros can't get enough of. Believe it or not, they used to build full-on race cars and prepared something truly bizarre for 1955's running of Le Mans. Formerly christened De Malnar, which was a combination of Enrico Nardi and his chief engineer's last names, the car was more commonly known as the Bizzoluro, which roughly translates to twin torpedo. The name is fairly self-explanatory, but not much else about this thing is. An outlandish amalgamation of vehicle parts, the car was based on a Fiat 500 chassis, used a BMW 750cc motorcycle engine, and was cooled by a giant center-mounted airplane-style radiator. It probably never even saw a wind tunnel, but you can tell from the excessive bodywork that aero was a major design focus. The other big idea? Achieve even weight distribution by having the driver sit on one side of the car while mounting the engine on the other. And if that's still not weird enough for you, the steering wheel took the shape of an oval. But hey, they were ahead of their time there. So how did it perform? Well, it weighed around a thousand pounds, but only had somewhere between 50 and 60 horsepower. And maybe you can tell just by looking at it, but it didn't handle well at all. There's some debate on what really happened, but the story goes that the car was so sensitive to wind that a passing car literally blew it off the track. But regardless of its performance, the Bizzoluro was quite the undertaking, and you have to give credit for the effort involved, if nothing else. Using an aircraft engine in a race car wasn't a new idea in the 60s, and with turbine engine technology on the rise, it was only a matter of time before a mad scientist would attempt to win the Indy 500 with one. That scientist was Ken Wallace, an aerospace engineer whose deranged idea was rejected by the likes of racing legend Carroll Shelby. Eventually, the concept found a home with the Grand Telly brothers, who were in charge of STP's racing efforts, and the team began designing one of the most radical cars ever to see the brickyard. The STP Paxton Turbo Car was like the Bizzoluro in that the engine was placed next to the driver, except just about everything else about it was better. The engine was a Pratt & Whitney ST6, derived from an engine normally seen in turboprop planes. Capable of 550 horsepower and mounted up to a four-wheel drive system, the car may have been 400 pounds over the minimum weight, but that didn't matter. 550 horsepower in a 1,750 pound car was enough to put a sizable lead on the rest of the field. Reportedly, the car had a three second throttle lag in waiting for the engine to come up to speed, but that didn't matter either. Racing legend Parnelli Jones was brave enough to pilot the thing and nearly won the race until a bearing failure with just three laps to go. The car attempted another run the following year in 1968, but crashed during qualifying. Heartbreaking for sure. At least the team could hold their heads up high for being one of the most innovative and stylish entries. So, admittedly awarding the weirdest race car title for the 70s was pretty difficult, because there were a lot of them. From pet rocks to questionable fashion, the 70s were peak weirdness, and the world of racing was no different. Here in the States, two men named Jim were busy figuring out how to achieve downforce by quite literally sucking their car into the ground. Meanwhile, across the pond, 
An F1 team was busy fitting extra wheels to the front of their car, but we'll get to them in a bit. The answer to Jim Squared's downforce dilemma came in the form of two fans from a tank mated to a two-stroke engine typically found on snowmobiles. The fans ducted air out from underneath the car, and combined with Lexan's skirts, created enough force to pull the Chaparral 2J two inches closer to the ground. So long as the fans were running, the car had over 1.2 Gs of downforce at nearly any speed. This gave it immense cornering ability, while a 650 horsepower V8 gave it plenty of get up and go in the streets. Unfortunately, the two-stroke engine running the fans frequently had issues before it was outlawed by the bitter people who wrote the rules. Now over to the six-wheeled Formula One experiment. The Terrell P34 was the British team's answer to F1's restrictive front wing regulations, which typically meant that the tires would protrude past the sides and above the top of the front wing. Bad for both downforce and overall aerodynamic flow. Fitting a small enough front wheel would certainly clean up airflow, but just two wouldn't allow for nearly enough tire contact patch. So the obvious solution? Add two more. The steering wheel controlled the frontmost wheels, while the rearward wheels were mechanically linked with a bell crank. When the P-34 was unveiled for the 1976 season, people were convinced it was a publicity stunt. But it probably performed better than you would have expected. Between the 1976 and 1977 season, the six-wheeler picked up 14 podiums and a win. And you can probably predict how the story ends. Yup, eventually the rules were changed to completely outlaw six-wheeled cars. Idaho doesn't get much notoriety for anything other than potatoes, but back in the 80s, the owner of Boise-based Eagle Aircraft Company was scheming an attempt at the Indy 500 unlike any other. A multi-millionaire named Joe Turtling put forth a simple proposal. If Eagle's Dean Wilson could design and build a race car for the 500, he'd pay for it. Seeing it as an excellent marketing opportunity, Turling gave Wilson free reign to design the car. Wilson was a respected designer in his own right, but most of his experience was with crop dusting planes, so he relied on that, perhaps a little too heavily. He came up with this, the DW-2, more commonly known as the Eagle Aircraft Flyer Special, and special it was. Built in one of his aircraft hangars, the Hot Wheels looking contraption had a chromoly tube frame and an aluminum skin, much like Eagle's planes. It even used balsa wood in the rear vertical fins, while other race cars of the time were moving on to more advanced materials and honeycomb structures. If the odd material choices weren't enough to differentiate it, just look at it. The engine behind the driver was a Chevy 355 cubic inch V8, and in front of the driver was, well, nothing. Driver Ken Hamilton was quoted as saying, Literally, my feet were six inches from the wall if I had gone straight into the wall. With the same wheelbase as a 1996 Dodge Ram, this thing was comically long for an 80s indie racer, and its odd aero elements gave it far more grip in the front than in the rear. Not a great recipe for an oval car. The car was ultimately too slow to qualify for the race, but that's probably a good thing. Ken and his son Davey gave all kinds of terrifying accounts about what the car was like to drive. Between lift in the cockpit that would nearly pull off your helmet and trying to get around the track without spinning at 180 miles an hour. That didn't happen, by the way. The car spun out twice over the course of three days. Without a doubt, a valiant effort, but a lesson that sometimes making something too different from the competition is a recipe for disaster. Whether you call them minivans or MPVs, there's no denying that by the 90s, nearly every mom wanted one and nearly every dad begrudgingly complied. French automaker Peugeot got in on the craze in 1994, releasing the 806. But for them, a backseat full of crayon-eating three-year-olds wasn't enough of a torture test. So in a beautifully insane marketing stunt, they decided to race one. And what better place to do it than a 24-hour endurance race at Spa in 1995. Knowing full well the demands of such a race, 
Peugeot dropped off the van at Kronos Racing, who was responsible for their factory motorsport efforts at the time. Kronos fitted all kinds of goodies from the 405 race car, including a sequential transmission, suspension, and cylinder head, while the engine block was taken from the 306 rally car. All said and done, power output was reported at just below 300 horsepower, and the gutted van weighed right around 2,400 pounds. But was it competitive? Absolutely, and not just for a minivan. The modified 806 qualified third in its class, but the problems came quickly once the race began. Eventually, an engine failure ended the dream of a minivan placing on the podium at Spa, and the van was retired from competition. Regardless, it pushed the boundaries of what a touring car could be, and I don't think I'm alone in saying that I'd love to see it hit the track again. Pushing the boundaries and perceptions of an experimental technology could also be considered weird, and that's exactly what BMW did in 2004 with the H2R. The hydrogen record car certainly wasn't the first hydrogen-powered car, but it was a notable example in the performance car space. Impressively developed in under 10 months, the car featured the aluminum frame and carbon fiber bodywork you'd expect, but just how the hydrogen powered it is where things get interesting. Rather than using a fuel cell to generate electricity and power electric motors like today's hydrogen cars, the H2R was an internal combustion vehicle. Adopting a modified V12 engine from the 760i, the car used liquid hydrogen as fuel and ran on a normal four-stroke engine cycle. Despite only making around 232 horsepower, the car had an extremely low drag coefficient of just 0.21 enabling it to set nine different hydrogen car records and reach a top speed of 187 miles per hour. The catfish-looking record breaker may not be the most exciting car on this list, but for something developed in 2004, it was cutting edge and helped spark industry interest in continuing to explore hydrogen power. These days, when you hear about Garage 56, you probably think of the modified NASCAR that competed this past June. But travel back in time to 2012, and there was a much more peculiar vehicle filling the experimental entry. The Delta Wing made its racing debut as the Le Mans Garage 56 entry of that year, looking like an SR71 Blackbird on wheels. Designed by Ben Bowlby, Nissan agreed to supply a turbocharged inline four in exchange for naming and advertising rights to the car. So what was there possibly to be gained by designing something so unconventional? The Delta Wing took a less is more approach. Less power than competitors would mean less fuel consumption, while the slim wing shape would mean less weight and less drag. With 72% of the car's weight over the rear wheels, the front tires were able to be hilariously narrow at only four inches wide. Less weight on the front tires also meant that they could last even longer between changes. The car's 2012 Le Mans outing was ended prematurely by a collision with a Toyota LMP1 car, but the Delta Wing did manage to record some lap times on pace with the LMP2 field. Not wanting to give up hope on the concept, Panos took over the Delta Wing project in 2013 and made some pretty big changes, including closing off the cockpit, redesigning the chassis, and switching to a 1.9 liter 350 horsepower engine. Competing in various sports car championships until 2016, the Delta Wing was never really competitive and had a history mired with controversy, including the time Don Panos and Chip Ganassi sued the original designer for developing a similar car in partnership with Nissan. The closest thing we'll probably ever see to a rocket ship in a sports car race, there's no doubt that the Delta Wing deserves the weirdest race car title for the 2010s. So there's a look at some of the most unique automotive oddities to ever see a racetrack. Do you agree with the list? Let me know which was your favorite, and feel free to mention any weird cars I might have left out. Thanks for watching.